Okay, good to go. Oh, we've got two more that are coming in. Okay, great. So I am going to share my screen and I hope that everyone can see what I will be presenting. Let's see here. All right, if you could just give me a thumbs up. If it's all good. Great, excellent. Okay, and then I'm just gonna move this to the side so that you can see. I have a couple of things in my view here. Here we go, play. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Great. All right, I'm just going to move a few more things here. My, uh, hang on a second, my mouse disappeared. Okay, I'm gonna move this. Side. All right, and I think that they should be good. Bye. Yeah, I still can't seem to see my mouse. So let me make sure because I don't want anyone not to be admitted while we're doing this here. I also don't want to waste any time. Okay, I think this is about as good as it's going to get here. Okay, great. So um, we will get started. I this is really hang on a second, guys. Participant part is blocking my view here. And if it comes down to it, I can pull it up on my tablet too. <laughs> okay, so we should be good now. Perfect. Hi, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. My mouse has disappeared. I don't quite understand why, but you know, it is what it is, technology, right? So thank you again for joining me today, STEM in the classroom. Um, you know, I, I want to start off with my one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Wonder is the beginning of wisdom. What a beautiful thing to say when we're discussing early childhood education. Um, because they are at the beginning stages of their lives and wonder is such a big part of their lives. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Caitlin Pass. I am currently a lead ECE educator in uh, the private sector, in a private sector preschool in Santa Clarita. Um, it's Christ Lutheran Preschool, so it is uh, religious based, although we don't teach um, religious-based curriculum in the classroom. Um, we are proud of our yard. We have a beautiful outdoor classroom. Um, we have a forest in our yard, a space that has a stream. We have um, a wood chip area that has a mud kitchen. We take pride in the space for the children that allows them to freely explore um, natural items, a lot of wood in our yard and um, things like that. So hang on one second here, guys. I'm so sorry. I just need to see if we have any more participants. Okay. I can't even see anyone either. I'm so sorry. I feel so bad. I can't see anyone's faces. Okay, we'll continue. So uh, my background is in uh, biology and early childhood education. I started working at College of the Canyons in a lab school. Um, I, you know, was on the garden committee. We started a, started a community garden at the school. We uh, also created an outdoor environment for the children, um, for the outdoor classroom. For those of you that aren't aware or familiar with the outdoor classroom, it is um, put together by a school in La Cañada. It's the Outdoor Classroom Project. They, uh, oh, here we go. I can see now that people are wanting to be admitted. <laughs> there we go. I think it's starting to work. Um, so I was certified in that. 
and uh, basically uh, creating a nature-based curriculum for children. Uh, I reside in LA County with my family. Uh, there I am with my two kids, my husband, and uh, in my classroom. So I specialize in outdoor play, inquiry-based learning, and using a mixture of philosophies in the classroom. So we kind of just at our school, we take a little bit from every, excuse me, from everything. So I want to know about you. I want to know if you could put in your chat box, you know, what is your name? Where are you in your ECE journey? I'd love to hear who my audience is, um, you know, whether you're a teacher or if you are, you know, a student um, or if you're thinking of going to school. I always love hearing where, um, what my audience is. So I'm just going to close this really quick just so I can see the chat box. I just want to see, oh, Cerritos College, El Camino College, great. Miramar College, East Los Angeles, fantastic. So I went to College of the Canyons and then I went on to uh, CSUN. I majored in early childhood education at College of the Canyons. Great. We can continue. Let's see here. Ah, that chat box now. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, excellent. So, a little bit what to expect for today's workshop. Um, we'll go from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. We'll have a break in between. Questions and comments are welcome. Um, you are welcome to, I said raise hand function, but Unfortunately, I cannot see you guys um, when I'm sharing my screen. So if you could add it to the chat box, I'm happy or um, feel free to unmute yourself too. I want to learn from each other. Um, you know, I've saved time at the end for questions, but I want to hear from you. If you have anything that you'd like to share, please feel free to do so. Um, and then also, Copies of the PowerPoint will be emailed at the conclusion of the workshop. So any kind of resources, um, we'll get those over to you guys. Okay, so what is STEM? So let's see if this works, please. I hope it does. If you can, unmute yourself. And if anybody wants to say, you know, what is STEM? Let's see here. I wonder if I could, um, yeah, I can't when I'm sharing my screen. Go ahead in the chat box. If anybody knows what STEM is, go ahead and write out. <laughs> oh, I hear someone unmuted. Oh, that's okay. If you know what STEM is, please feel free to shout it out. <laughs> um, science, technology. I guess it's electronics and math. Is that close? Close. So the E is engineering. Oh, engineering. That's yeah, right. yeah. Engineering. But electronics yeah. goes hand in hand with that. It really does. <laughs> so good. Yes. Okay. So what is STEM? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Let's see this. Um, so STEM originated. Um, its popularity originated from the National Science Foundation. Uh, it came about because, uh, you know, as the third bullet point says, in recent years, STEM has become a focus in education because there's been a lack of focus on the skills in schools, yet an increase to the need in our workforce. Um, STEM in the future, especially for this generation, it's booming. The workforce is requiring jobs in engineering, especially tech. Tech jobs are um, in high demand. And what we're finding is that the children are not meeting the standards in order to be successful in terms of just basic skills of problem solving. Um, and we'll go further into that. So the main definition here is the term STEM education refers to a teaching and learning in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It typically includes educational activities across all grades from preschool to postdoctorate. So I tried to get a roundabout number of, um, only have a couple more, 
um, a roundabout number of um, budget through the government and it's in the billions for STEM funding. Uh, it's incredible. There's a lot of money out there and, and some of it's being filtered through to the, the preschool se sector too. So, um, you know, I mean, it's going in career technical education as well as into the Department of Defense has funding for, uh, for STEM. So it's a big part of our education system right now. Uh, there, it's a big key term in, um, in what we're asking for from our kids. Okay, so STEM can be unique to a teacher's perception. STEM is sometimes I feel it can be overwhelming from especially a teacher's point of view. So we often think, oh, a STEM activity, does that mean that I have to do science, technology, engineering, and math all in one lesson? Well, not necessarily. Some people will say that it needs to be all encompassing and then others say that it needs one focus. I feel as though in the preschool sector, it can be only one focus because we have so much flexibility as preschool teachers in that our children are, they have that wonder, that sense of wonder. Um, they are learning something that has to do with math, but when they're doing the math, somehow science is implemented. Um, here I've said preschool teachers are inclined to use integrated curriculum. We often mix technology with science or engineering with math. For instance, um, here I have this picture. So this is my friend Abby. <laughs> At, this is our school. We have um, kind of just wood blocks everywhere. We have tree trunks, things like that. So they'll actually pick those up. They'll move them around. They'll put... Um, the planks down. So this is what she did. She moved those stumps together. She set that plank down and she said, Miss Caitlin, watch me balance. And so in that here we have engineering. And then we also have science because science consists of physical science. So she's needing to put that plank down. She's needing to balance it. She's needing to understand the physics of things in order to use it. So it's not, I want to express that don't get overwhelmed by STEM because it does not have to be just, um, it doesn't have to be all encompassing because of the flexibility that we have with children's, children's minds, they're beautiful. Um, and oftentimes learning from each subject will reinforce the other. So benefits of STEM, let me see how, I wanna make sure that I'm doing good on time, yes, okay. So benefits of STEM, it provides children with opportunities that might not be offered elsewhere. Um, you know, some schools are very urban. Some schools, children don't have the opportunity to explore items that, you know, occur in our world naturally. So for instance, I have a picture of my friend here. These are watering cans um, that we have out to water our um, bell pepper plants. And we had dirt off to the side soil that they could dig in. Well, I didn't want them to mix the soil and the water. And he said, he kind of snuck over and he did it anyways. And I immediately kind of was like, oh, no, 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 because that mixes with the water. And then how are you going to get him a bell first? So, but then I stopped myself and I thought, well, wait a minute. At what point? When, when is he going to have this opportunity to do this? Maybe at home, he doesn't have that. Maybe at home, you know, he doesn't have the freedom to go out and play outside and, and see what happens when you mix the water and the soil and creating mud and things like that. So when we offer STEM opportunities, it's not possibly not happening at home. Some people aren't science people and that's completely fine. Um, but at least uh, we can offer it there in the school. So it also encourages language development. They are talking about what they're seeing. We're using words, language, you know, oh, let's explore this. What do you see? What are you noticing? Well, I'm noticing X, Y, and Z. Or Miss Caitlin, when I mix the dirt in with the water, I made mud, you know, things like that. So the language is, it's building, they're, they're gaining more vocabulary and uh, so on and so forth. It builds self-character. 
So when my friend here was able to mix the water and the soil together without anyone stopping him, he's feeling confident. I mean, I'm sure he felt especially confident that he did it when I asked him not to. Uh, but it's building that sense of self that I am here, I am adding this, I am making this experiment, I am figuring this out. It's creating that um, accomplishment too. Um, and it might not just be outward accomplishment that we see, but it's happening inter internally, excuse me. Um, let's see here. So the next one is it establishes a foundation for lifelong critical thinking and problem solving skills. I'll show you some other pictures coming up uh, or, well, okay. So we have to go back to the other picture where my friend Abby was walking along her bridge that she made. At first, she wasn't able to connect that, that piece of wood. It wouldn't stay. So she had to think, how do I do this? She had to put those, those logs together, you know, far enough apart that it would work. And so there she was using problem solving, critically thinking. And then for us as teachers, for me, it was because she, of course, asked for help first. You know, Miss Kaylin, it's not working. Oh, well, Abby, what do you think you could do? I see you're wanting to put that bridge together. What, like, how do you, how could you do that? Okay, well, I think I can move them closer together. Um, so also, oh, my, um, my um, thing came back, my mouse. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Okay, good. All right, I'm so happy. <laughs> I can see things. <laughs> I can see you guys. Yes, I can see you now. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, good. So um, next we're on, okay, it uh, strengthens fine motor or motor skills generally. So we've got gross motor, we've got fine motor. You know, Abby had to lift that log and roll it. A lot of times they'll roll it. She had to roll it in order to get it placed there. Um, fine motor, when we're providing scientific tools for them, tweezers, things like that. I have a couple of tools that I brought to show, you know, so tweezers. So they're using that pinching motion here. And this is for the older preschoolers, but if we're talking infant toddler, you know, they're using their hands to grasp things. So it's developing motor skills um, in STEM. So also it fosters their natural need for discovery. Children want to experiment naturally. It's in there, it's, it's how we evolved as a species. Um, and a lot of times, and I can say that I am at fault with this as a parent too, that um, we say no when they wanna do certain things, when they wanna make the mud or when they wanna jump in the puddle or you know when they want to take a toy from another area and move over here maybe to build a bridge. Well, wait a minute, but that toy is supposed to stay over there. They, they need that um, ability to discover on their own. Uh, also teamwork, it builds teamwork. With the younger ages, not so much because there's a lot of that parallel play, right? So Abby, my friend is three. She might not have been okay with someone helping her. That, is, that was not within her plan. It's more along the parallel play lines. But when you get into the pre-K age or even um, school age, then they're working together, giving ideas. Oh, I want to build that bridge. Hey, let's add to that bridge. Uh, it also fosters creativity. So they have the freedom when we're talking about engineering, you're designing, you're in charge of designing this. How are you going to design that? Also, it teaches them it's okay to make mistakes. This is big for me because I am always trying to teach my children it's fine if it fell down. Let's try again. What can we do to make it better? Uh, a lot of our kids these days are so concerned about um, perfection and you see it, it causes a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety for them. Um, and if we're teaching them early, cause right, so early child educators, we kind of have them in the very beginning. We are like the basis of what their school career is going to be. And so if we're teaching them from the very bottom that 
it's okay to make those mistakes. Let's figure it out. Mistakes can be fun. Then hopefully that can grow with them in future years. And also, you know, teaching parents, hopefully that can grow with them in future years that when they're in elementary school, junior high, high school, that they're feeling confident enough to make these designs and to make the mistakes. And that's okay. It's no problem. All right, next one is, um, so I wanna go over um, each portion of what STEM is, right? So first one is science. So now that I can see you guys, <laughs> I want you to physically raise your hand if um, science was your favorite, favorite subject in school. I guess I don't have that many people that have their cameras on either, <laughs> but that's okay. Well, so science was my favorite subject, but I know for a lot of people it isn't. And that's where I say in the ECE environment that we can produce a love of science. So science, the definition is an area of study that deals with the natural world and is based on facts learned through experiments and observation. There are three components of science. So I wanna make sure that we go over these. So our first one is physical science. Physical science is um, the physical properties of materials, right? So you have movement of objects, forces, magnetism, gravity, uh, weight. So this is kind of um, along the lines of when they have say a car and they have it on a track and they have it on a ramp, let's say, and they're letting go of it. Well, the weight of the car is going to determine whether it's fast or if it's slow. And these are all things that their little minds are working on, but not necessarily um, consciously. They're, it's all just within their learning. Also, there's life science uh, in the science component. Life science is going to be like your biology type thing. So it's it's living creatures, talking about insects, talking about animals, um, you know, how plants are growing. And also with science, children are still at this age um, developing their, their, let's see, what's the word? They're differentiating between real versus pretend. So when we're providing them with these opportunities, you know, oh, so here's some worms in my picture here. Well, in the cartoons, the worms can do X, Y, and Z, but in real life, let's see what they can do. You know, let's take them out. In this picture here, my friend took them out, put them on a table because it looked like the ocean. <laughs> so she had lined them up there and, and we observed them and, and she had recognized that I don't think they like being on this table. I think that we need to put them back in the soil. So our next one is earth and space science. Earth and space science is, so first of all, earth science is going to be uh, your rocks, right? Your rocks, we talk about soil, um, weather, seasons, anything having to do with you know, our planet as a whole. And then space science, of course, being sun, planets, stars, things like that. All right, let's see here. All right, so our next one, our next component of STEM is mathematics. The science and study that explains numbers, quantities, measurements, and the relations between them. Uh, there are multiple components of math. So there's the numbers and operations. This is a picture of my daughter here uh, when she first started uh, preschool. And so the components, of, so the numbers and operations, we're talking about counting, right? We're talking about one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence. So meaning that one, belongs to this. Like, let's say we have five of these. One, two, three, four, five. Not six, seven, eight, nine, ten, which some children will do, right? How many of these? What do they find? Okay, six, seven, eight, and they'll just keep going and going, right? So the counting part is one-to-one -one correspondence, counting, subtracting. If I take one of these away, you know, well, what happened? How, how many are there? Then there's patterning, which some people also call algebra. Um, that's where they're classifying, uh, they're noticing different parts of the object. Uh, so this is a red bear and I'm going to put the red bear with all the other red bears. 
or this is a large bear. I'm going to put this large bear with all of the other large bears. And then we have geometry, which a lot of times we often think that's just shapes, getting to know our shapes, but actually it's not. There's more to it. It has to do with spatial relations. Um, you know, this is a circle, okay? But also this won't fit in this because this is large. So it's 3D thinking. Um, and when I grasp this, my hand can cover it. So um, geometry in that sense, it goes a little bit deeper than just knowing the shapes. And then also um, measurement. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, this is longer, comparing, shorter, things like that. And then lastly is data analysis. So um, data analysis can be in preschool in the form of graphing. You know, today we did, um, what's the book? Uh, Don't let the pigeon drive the bus. And then I asked everyone, we had a graph, you know, would you let the pigeon drive the bus? And I got five yeses and three no's and we graphed it. We graphed it with Legos. And then we also graphed it on a piece of paper. Uh, and then data analysis can be in voting too. I want you to raise your hand if you think that the pigeon should drive the bus. <laughs> so next is engineering. Uh, that's the application of science and mathematics to the goal of creating useful machines or structures. We're talking about making buildings, bridges, things like that. Uh, it's a product of math and science combined. It is, uh, its emphasis is in physical properties. So surface, surface texture, weight, force, that's what we talked about with the physical science. Uh, engineering is encompassing that. We have problem solving skills. Uh, it's heavy in experimenting. Children are, so in this picture here, you can see my mouse disappeared again. Perfect. <laughs> um, you can see these guys. I have a picture here on the side. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So my two friends here, they are experimenting with a piece of wood in a tire and they have a wooden truck. So they were trying to see if they could get the chart to go down, how the slant needed to be. Uh, like I said, heavy in experimenting and freedom in experimenting too. Like it, that goes back to, it's okay to make mistakes. Oh, it's not working. Well, here, let's move it at this angle. It also fosters creativity because they are using their creative minds to think of solutions uh, to get their ultimate plan to work. So we're talking building structures, bridges, racetracks, et cetera, when, um, when we say engineering. So our next one is technology. Now, this one can be a little bit more on the confusing side, um, just because Someone is trying to come in and I have to admit them. Hang on one second here. Hmm. I cannot seem to admit them at all. What a interesting. Hmm. Yeah, Megan, I can't, my um you want to make me co-host for a while? Well, Feel free to switch, switch it and I'll help. You know what? I was able to get it here. So I'm going to admit okay. them and then I'll. Anytime. Feel free to switch it over. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, great. So technology was a little bit confusing when I first dove into STEM. A lot of times we think, okay, well, technology, does that mean that we're exposing them to smartphones, things like that? Uh, no, not necessarily. So what well, a great thing that I read from this book here, this is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. I have it in our resources. It is teaching STEM in the early years. There's a great, so there's great um, uh, examples of curriculum that you could use, but most importantly, in the very beginning, it really kind of dives into STEM and everything. So one of the things that was said was that Technology was not derived from technology, right? So 
we had to start from a point to reach technology. So oftentimes we think, okay, hey, technology, smartphones. Well, no, it can be a tool. Technology can be tweezers, tongs. Before we had smartphones, we had things like, you know, we have these. Or, or in the classroom, you may use a baster. You know, you, you may use a magnifying glass. You can get really fancy and, and you can go beyond that. And here's another type of magnifying glass. So technology doesn't necessarily have to be an electronic, although I do feel that there's a place for electronics in the classroom in a way that they are able to explore, because that is the goal, that our world is moving a certain way and we need to keep them on board, but within a developmentally appropriate practices. So uh, technology produces a combination of mathematics, physics, and engineering. So you'll see now here that STEM is really encompassing that it doesn't necessarily have to be an activity that has a little bit of everything. It all kind of just blends together. And you'll find that when you're doing something that's a STEM curriculum, that you'll end up adding technology to it. You'll have the tools. Maybe you'll have um, you know, cassette tapes where the children can listen to a book about engineering. Also, you know, simple machines. So a pulley system, a lot of times we'll just throw a rope over a tree and add a bucket to it and use the pulley system. That is technology in itself. Thermometers, flashlights, children love flashlights. You get the low powered ones, turn the lights off. Um, mirrors, scales, I have a scale here um, that I'll show you guys. It's, you know, and a lot of the things I'm showing you too, they're from Amazon and they're so affordable. So adding things here, that's technology. Let's see here. Um, another option is cameras, videos. You could, uh, I've seen pictures of children who have used cameras to take pictures of the things that they uh, created, that they wanna share, that they wanna document. And also you could add into your dramatic play area, um, outdated technology. So a lot of times we'll have keyboards that are outdated or, or that you know, we don't use anymore because now we have laptops or an old broken laptop. We ha we'll have doctor's items out and it'll be paired with outdated technology. I saw this really cool idea where someone had taken old CDs and old, you know, cords and things like that. Nothing with the actual plug that could go into the wall because we have to still be safe. Um, and they called it the robot box. And the children were able to kind of put things together to build a robot. You know, that's adding technology into uh, your curriculum. Okay, so overall, let me see here. Overall, STEM is providing the children with real life experiences. It goes back to what I said before, that maybe a child doesn't have the opportunity to be exposed to these things, or maybe they are, but here we're just reinforcing it, that they're exposed to items that, I'm trying to see if I have anything not in front of me, um, but you know, wood and what I could do with this wood what I could do with this tool here, how I can use it versus a lot of children are put in front of a screen these days. I do wanna say that from my own research, it does look like our numbers are getting better. You know, I, I found that a uh, study was done, it was 85% of children um, three and older had access to screen time, right? But it didn't say how long the screen time was there has been a movement to reduce screen time. But just saying that there, that's a big number, 85% have access to screen time. And, and that's okay. Um, in a really good book that I read, Vitamin N, the author is Richard Louvre. He explains the hybrid child. So the hybrid child being one that is still exposed to technology, but also has the problem solving skills from being from uh, emerging themselves in just natural items, working in nature. So my workshop actually in two days is nature-based play. I could go on and on about that too. Um, so if you're interested in that, you could uh, join that workshop. 
But anyway, so we're providing children with real life experiences. Uh, as an educator, you are, we are providing materials that are relevant to the world they are growing up in as they continue to develop the difference between reality and fantasy. And that goes back to the screen time that they're exposed to things on TV, but here we're actually giving it to them physically. They can watch a science video, but here they're actually able to pick up those tweezers and use them. Uh, children re require hands-on play that fosters their development in age-appropriate ways. They do. They, they, our preschool is play-based. Children require play. There is a system that their bodies go through when they're playing. They are actively learning in play. So here, I want to see... Let's see, what does STEM in the class line, classroom look like for different ages? Um, so we'll kind of go over, we'll kind of go over what it'll look like because STEM, like I said, the funding right now is preschool all the way up to adulthood, um, what it looks like at different ages in the preschool classroom. So starting off here, we have infant toddler. Infant toddler is going to be very concrete. Um, they are learning size, smell, scent, taste, and simple cause and effect. I mean, we're talking five senses. That's what's developing. Um, simple cause and effect. When I pick this up and I drop it, you know, what happens? And I'm going to keep doing it, right? So it's like when you give, uh, you're holding the baby and then you give them a toy and then you see the moms at the store and the kids you know dropping it constantly <laughs> and the mom's going stop dropping it well there's cause and effect that's happening there sometimes it can be a little bit more than cause and effect <laughs> i have seen this with my own children too um but there is learning that's going on oh i dropped it and it's down here now a toddler so let's say we have a ramp right and and a, a baby's you know, dropping it here and, and watching the ball going down and maybe, you know, clapping. So you get some sort of input back from them. Whereas a toddler might be more apt to, an older approaching three-year-old might be more apt to, okay, it fell. Now I'm going to stand up. I'm going to go get that ball. I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to put it back on top of the ramp. And they might try a different spot on the ramp or they might try the same spot on the ramp. They're developing spatial awareness. Again, it goes back to, okay, this is big. Let's see, will it fit in here? Oh, okay, it fits in here. You know, uh, will, will it fit in here? Oh, no, it's not going to fit in here. Um, they, experiments with, they experiment with different uses and physical properties of objects. So like I said, it's just very con concrete. Uh, and then communication with infant toddler, it's more nonverbal. So when you're doing STEM activities with the little ones, um, you're not able to get that verbal feedback. Miss Caitlin, you know, let's explore this. I'm, I'm observing that or I predict that it's going to be more of the clapping or the, the facial expressions, the excitement of I dropped the ball and it went down, you know, and their, their bodies are excited. And so it does take, when you incorporate STEM into the earlier years, it does take more observation on the teacher's part. And also, you know, children, infant toddlers, they are learning from also that adult interaction. And so your response to them is going to tell them whether or not, you know, that was accurate. Oh, yeah. And we're saying, oh, the ball, the ball rolled down. I wonder if we could do that again. Oh, again, you know. They're learning those words. Uh, facilitate STEM by providing multi-sensory experiences. So these are some options that you could use for infant toddler. Uh, water play, baskets of various size items, blocks, balls, tools such as color viewers. I actually brought some of those. We so have these, they're from Amazon. It's like $5 for a pack of eight. And it comes with all the different colors, right? So this is really fun for the three and four year olds too. Even school age. I mean, my daughter is school age and she'll use them. So they can kind of look through them. Infant toddler, there are blocks that have this coloring in the center too. Uh, and they also love those. So, and then repetition. Repetition for this age is crucial because they're experimenting, 
their cause and effect, seeing it again and again until, you know, it, it's solid. It's a solid foundation for them that this ball, when I let go of it, it is going to drop. It is going to fall. So here's a really neat, um, uh, you know, picture of things that you could do uh, supporting STEM in infants and toddlers. Now you might see that it says STEAM. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The A in STEM is art because there's a huge push to add art into STEM and I am on board with that. I think that's fantastic. So it kind of shows ways of incorporating STEM, you know, birth to nine months, a mirror on the floor for looking and crawling over. That mirror is your technology. Um, you know, the, the mirror is also physical science, reflection. The light is a part of, you know, earth science, um, space science. You've got the sunlight coming down or, you know, life science as well. If you add objects, plants, pieces of plants on a mirror and them seeing the reflection. <coughs> the vocabulary to include in conversation, you know, observe, notice, learning, hypothesis. Some of those words are a little bit big for those ages. Um, but using more language such as, oh, I see you're noticing that when you did this, this happened. That ball rolled down. Yes, you're seeing that. I wonder what's gonna happen if we do this. So I wonder, well, let's try that. Oh, I think, I think this is going to happen. Let's test it. Those are great words to use. Uh, and then it goes on. So, you know, 16 to 36 months, sand or water with various measuring, stirring and sifting tools, rubber balls and open spaces for rolling, sackable or connectable items like cardboard boxes and blocks. That is actually really, really fun for those, for that age. Even I, you know, I teach threes right now. So they love to stack things. That is their favorite they and then you know it's you put out dolls or things like that and they just want to stack and then they stack the dolls right on top <laughs> not necessarily building a structure yet for the dolls i just want to see if i can balance them on top and do not knock it down either <laughs> all right so uh in the preschool age make sure i'm good on time i don't want to be talking too much um, so for the preschool age, so for threes, uh, you're going to see parallel play. So we talked about with STEM, benefits of STEM, um, it's encouraging um, teamwork. And so with the threes, like, you know, this friend here, he was pretty content with working on his uh, pumpkin balance by himself. And that's okay. You know, we, we don't push in my classroom. I don't push them to share. Um, I do encourage working together, but also think about it. If you're building something and someone comes in and they're coming in to take all of it and to make it their way, he, they're going to lose what they're working on. So there's language that you can use to, oh, you know, it looks like, like Bradley wants to come and sit here and work on this. What do you think about that? Oh, well, I don't want him to. He's going to knock over my building. Bradley, he says you're going to knock over his building. What do you think? Do you, do you think, you know, that that would happen? And, and then getting the conversation started because they're just developing that. But a lot of it with threes is the parallel play. So when you have items out, STEM activities, it might be that they're creating just next to each other, not together, not cooperatively. Um, and then the fours, you're going to get that cooperative play, right? So you're going to put STEM out. Let's say I have, we recently added to our school wooden roads that they, like I said, it, we're dealing with the physics of that we have little construction hats and things like that. And they can roll the, the cars down. They can angle them at different levels. Um, and then you can also build with them. So with the fours, they're more apt to, hey, you know, Sean, go put that over there and I'm going to put this one here and then we're going to build such and such. And this looks like my house and this looks like my road. Whereas the threes are pretty much like I'm here working with this one. You can work here and then we're, we'll just be next to each other. Uh, they're 
uh, building fine motor skills, the threes, it's impressive. I always love working with threes because in the very beginning of the semester, you get this with the tweezers, right? They're like manipulating it any way they can. How do I pick this up? And they get so frustrated. Miss Kaylin, it's not working. Okay, well, let's give it a try. And now here we are at the end of the semester, they're approaching four and they're doing this, right? Or I have these here you know, in the beginning, they're going like this. And this is what you'll see with infant toddlers too, is they'll, well, probably more toddlers, but they'll be picking things up this way. The three-year-olds started this way and now they're putting their fingers in and they're manipulating on their own. So um, the threes might be more of this, whereas the fours might be more of this. Uh, there's a lot of different tools like this here. This is kind of a tricky one. Um, the fours get this a lot easier than the threes. The threes are you know, pushing it with all their might with two hands and then understanding the concept too of how this tool works. Threes, like I said, they enjoy stacking. So I had multiple kids for this activity in the picture that I have here. Um, hi, honey, go on. <laughs> my, my daughter. Okay, all right, go on. It's not on there, honey. It's not on there. All right, she loves Ice Age and Ice Age is not available right now. <laughs> um, and so let's see here. Uh, enjoy stacking, right? So he was content stacking this STEM activity that we did. Oh, my table is, this is, was our art table. It's wrecked. I mean, this table has like seen everything. Um, we did five little pumpkins sitting on a gate, right? And so I said, okay, well, let's see if we can make a gate. Let's see if you can add five little pumpkins. And what you'll see there is those orange wooden blocks. Those are lacing blocks that I feel like a lot of preschools have. And then the round um, pumpkins and like kind of the oval ones, those are rocks that I just painted. So another thing I wanna emphasize is you do not need these expensive toys to create STEM activities. It's not necessary. Um, you can use items that you have in your household. These are just wooden blocks of kind of mishposh of things. And then, like I said, the rocks. So he was content stacking his items and um, not necessarily building anything else besides just the gate, experimenting the balance. Whereas with fours, you may get them putting the rock down and building a house around the rock or building a gate for the rock and then also a walkway for the rock, things like that. Okay, let me um, see here really quick, guys. There's another person that's trying to add. Hmm. Oh my, there we go. Perfect. I'm getting the hang of it, you guys. My Zoom experience is pretty much Girl Scouts with a bunch of kids and we just like, the kids just talk to each other and that's it. So, <laughs> okay, perfect. Good, we're moving along. Um, let me see, I wanna make sure I didn't forget anything on this portion. Um, okay, so fours also with STEM, it's going to be easier to combine multiple materials in play. You may add blocks and you may add, um, let's say safari animals. I wonder if we could build a zoo. How do you think we could build a zoo? So the fours may be more apt to building that zoo and adding the animals into it and maybe finding something else in the classroom to add to that. With fours, when you put engineering activities out, you can add a whole lot more. With threes, sometimes less is more. And this also goes for the toddlers as well. Okay, so what has been your favorite science-based moment in your life? I just want to escape here. I'm gonna stop sharing. And this is right before we'll take our break shortly because we are approaching four o'clock. Um, and I promise you guys a break midway through. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then, here we go. Okay, so if anybody wants to share, I'd love to hear um, what 
uh, has been your favorite science-based moment in your life? And what I mean about that is, um, you know, maybe you have a memory from school. I did this experiment in school and I loved it. Or maybe in college, I had this one teacher and I absolutely loved it. Or with your own children, or if you're working currently, anything that's experimental based that we've already discussed now, I'd love for you to share, um, you know, your, your favorite moment in science. And then hopefully I can do this right, you guys. Actually, Megan, I'm gonna make you host. Yes, so if there's a problem and then when we share screen. Sure. Let's see. Change host. Okay, Megan, you are the host now. <laughs> I see Jennifer's hand up. Okay, great. Jennifer, I'd love to hear you share. So, hi. Um, actually, I did this experiment with my um, child development professor. Um, it was a math and science curriculum course, and she showed us how to make bubbles using dry ice and dish soap. And I think there were some other ingredients that I can't remember. It's been several years, but um, what's really awesome about this dry ice bubble, so um, it's like a bubble, a lot, kind of like a medium-sized bubble with um, that dry ice smoke inside. Mm. So it, it, it doesn't float the way a normal bubble would, but it's really interesting to see this thing hovering with dry ice smoke inside. And if you wear gloves, you can kind of bounce it from your palm to the other palm, kind of like, uh, she said, like playing patty cake. If you're play, uh, pay, playing patty cake with someone, you can bounce the ball or the, the bubble gently to um, another person. So I thought just to, that just kind of defies everything that, uh, you know, that um, what I was visually seeing, it was very rich in that. And then um, uh, the other one that I can think of um, is at the California Science Center near USC or is next to USC, there was um, a section about um, arches and bridges. And so there were a lot of these interesting, um, uh, I guess they're like cushions, like pillows um, that were kind of like parts to a puzzle where you had to build an arch using them. And I thought it couldn't be done just because they're like, kind of like pillows. And, uh, but sure enough, um, we were able to have other people hold parts of the arch and stick a wedge in there and it, it held actually. It wasn't sturdy, but it, it held. So I thought that was really neat to see. <laughs> I love it. That's one thing we'll talk about later is I've said where to get ideas from museums. Museums are the best place to get ideas from. I mean, the things that they come up with are so incredible. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Does anybody else want to share um, their favorite science-based? Oh, great. Michelle. Hi, so I just wanted to share how um, my favorite part was um, like going to the museums, uh, the California Science Center. There is a part where you like you could go touch um, the like sea stuff, like sea creatures. And so for me, like you mentioned, a lot of the kids don't have that freedom. For me, my dad personally, um, he is still a germaphobe. But, uh, so like no touching, no nothing. So when I was in school and he wasn't there, um, well, he didn't see me touch all these things. So I think it's really important, like you said, to give them the freedom just because we don't know what it's, what their situation is like at home. A hundred percent. Oh my gosh. I love it. That's so great. And museums again, it's fantastic. And the fact that, yeah, without, when are we ever going to be able to touch sea life? I mean, unless you go to a tide pool, but those are so hard to find and and given those opportunities, we would otherwise never have. And then you build appreciation for it too, right? Like you have this whole new appreciation for starfish and you realize that, you know, maybe they're not gonna give you germs. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Does anybody else wanna share before we go on our break? Alrighty, well, we'll take just a five minute break. And then um, we'll come back. Uh, and then, so the second portion of this workshop then is gonna be more classroom-based. So we kind of got the general idea of what STEM is. And then the next portion will be uh, classroom-based. Uh, what will, uh, 
you know, how STEM will look in your, in your class. So we'll return, let me see what time it is right now, 3.59. So we'll return at like, you know, 4.04, 4.05, okay? Okay, great. So I'll go back to share screen. Okay, so we talked about how to facilitate STEM in the EC classroom, emergent curriculum, providing multitude of tools, um, allowing for free play and creativity. When you have an activity out you know, allow them to use it freely. A lot of times I was talking about this with my um, coworker today, that we enjoy, we see a huge benefit from leaving something out and them using it freely. Although sometimes it does help when there's a demonstration ahead of time. This is me personally. Some people don't feel that there needs to be a demonstration. Um, and that's totally fine. You know, it goes back to every teacher has their own perception of how STEM should be implemented. And for me, I really enjoy showing them at circle time, right? So the activity I was talking about with my coworker was using pipettes to drop into little, um, little like ice cube trays, right? And so you just keep, you kind of pass the pipe up, pipette around. This is for older kids too. This is for more like pre-K, TK age. And they just keep adding the water. So when you add water, sometimes we notice that it has like kind of that dome. And then eventually that dome spills out, right? So that's the goal is how, how full can we get it before it spills out? Well, you know, one teacher was saying, well, I would just leave it out. And then they could use the pipettes and, and they'll see it and they'll work with it. And then, you know, we were kind of saying, yeah, but if you do it at circle time, you have this, this teamwork that's going on. Okay. So we're noticing, we're using the language. Oh yeah. Let, let's see if we add one more. Let's explore this. What's going to happen. Let's predict if you add this one drop, what, okay. What is your observation? We added that and then it spilled over. So then after circle time, you know, they, they go off and they have this free play opportunity. Maybe they choose to continue the dropping until it spills over. Or maybe they decide that they want to take a whole cup full of water and they want to dump it on and then see what happens there. And that's okay. That's the beauty of the free play and the creativity. Um, I do feel that there's a benefit with a little bit of instruction. It doesn't necessarily have to be instruction with, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. It can be instruction in terms of Oh, look, look what I can do. I, I wonder if you could do that too. Providing an inviting space with preset materials. I have learned this in the years that I have taught. When you have an inviting space, there's a lot more learning that goes on. Um, let's see here. So I could put out a basket of blocks in a corner, right? Or in the center of the room for that matter. Are children going to approach it possibly? You know, they might start building with it. Depends on what else is in the classroom. But if you have a goal in mind, so let's say we're talking about skyscrapers, right? So you could do a unit on skyscrapers. Well, you have the blocks out and you have them, you can put a platform out and you have the blocks on the platform. And then you have a book next to those blocks. And then maybe you have some people. And then maybe as a teacher, we've kind of started one skyscraper. Now I'm not saying a whole skyscraper. We're not doing a demonstration like complete this here. No, it's look at all these options you have and how can you design your own? Another option is to put a clipboard out. So I have that down there in the bullet points. Clipboards, they can design their architecture 
and then they can make it happen. All right, so providing that inviting space, we wanna look at that. We have to put ourselves in the children's point of view. Oh, I wanna go play with that. Like museums are so good at that. You look at it and you go, I wanna explore that. That looks like so much fun. Um, so yeah, just providing that area for them, it really gets them moving. And a lot of times if I notice that one, so, okay, for instance, I just painted all these wood boards, right? To look like roads. And that's what I was talking about where the kids are like, you know, building the roads, building bridges and things like that. They're like two by fours that I painted gray. There's a picture in here somewhere um, in a couple of slides and I'll show you. So all the other classes are using them, right? The kids are putting on the construction costume. They've got the hat. They're using, we used wooden cars. We tried to keep materials all natural. They're driving them. My class could care less. They're not even using them. They're walking past it. They want to ride the bikes, right? And so I thought one day, because I was encouraging them, oh, like, Abby, go check that out. Look what's new over in our yard. Nothing. I wasn't getting anything from them. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to sit over here and then I'm going to see what happens. So I just went over. It's actually our stage for building our pallets that we've sealed. So I've sat on this pallet stage just quietly and all of a sudden they started kind of coming over. What are you doing, Miss Caitlin? Oh, well, I don't know. And I just saw this and, and I kind of take one car out and just roll it. And then all of a sudden it was well, I want to try this. Can you put this hat on me? Can I put the construction vest on? Um, you know, how do we build this? And then all of a sudden they're playing. So sometimes all it takes to is just an adult to be close by, to sit there. They want that engagement um, to really get those wheels turning. Clipboards, like I said, clipboards are great. I love them. Anytime we have a science, um, you know, a science center or something along the lines. You know, we just did butterflies, right? Um, we had the caterpillars. We looked at the different stages. We're using math. We're counting the different stages. Uh, you know, life science, we're seeing how they change. I had clipboards out so they could look at them and they can draw. And I have three-year-olds. So drawing a butterfly might just be a circle and that's okay. You know, they're, they're building that fine motor. They're using that item like they see adults are doing, they're role modeling and it, they're, you know, they're building on it as they get older. Oh, well, maybe, you know, even with school age, I'm going to write an observation and you could do that as a teacher too. Oh, look at this clipboard. Let's write down what we see with the, the butterfly. Oh, it's orange. I'm going to write the word orange here, things like that. And then maybe they kind of do like their pretend scribbling that they do. Uh, start small and build on ideas. It's so easy to get caught up in the Pinterest whirlwind. Um, I want to make sure if we're doing okay on time. So easy to get caught up in the bloggers and the influencers. There's so much out there. Buy this, buy that, you know, do this, do that. And sometimes we overwhelm ourselves as teachers and we put all the things out and then it just does not work. So what I have found is if you start small, you can add more. You kind of get these ideas, you observe them and you watch them. Oh, look, they're trying to do this. I think tomorrow I'm going to add people to those blocks. Um, or I think I'm going to add more pumpkins to that area because that's what they need to continue that, that growth and learning. Go outdoors. STEM outdoors is like the best thing ever. Like I said, my next workshop is uh, nature-based learning. There is a huge benefit to children being outdoors. Um, and outdoors, you have much more space. Not so worried about blocks falling and bumping others. Classrooms get really loud outside. You have this open space. And that's not to say, you know, my, my yard has open space. Even smaller yards at smaller preschools, it's just nice to be outdoors. Um, and then lastly, learning with the children we're learning with them like i said i i sat there on the pallet stage and i waited and i learned with them when they were ready to come over and experiment i i was right there along with them with the learning experience 
using the language. Oh yeah, you, you, you put that road there. Wow, and some of them will amaze you. I mean, some of the things that they've come up with, it's incredible because I never would have thought of that. Oh my goodness, you stacked it right there and you actually built that, you know, fantastic. We show excitement, they have the return excitement. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, documenting STEM. I think that documenting is a great thing. It can be tricky sometimes. <coughs> excuse me. Um, it can be tricky in the sense that as teachers, we have a lot to do, but if you have time to document, there's so many benefits. A, it provides teachers with an idea of where the learning could go next. It gives us a moment to reflect. So you've documented, you know, for instance, we were making nature soup one day outside and I took pictures of the children and I documented it on a wall outside for the parents and the children to see. And when I looked at that, I was able to reflect on, okay, they really enjoyed that. How can we build upon this nature soup that they're making? They were really curious with the items, the, the greenery in the yard, the seeds and things like this. Well, gosh, maybe next time we can explore further into what this pine cone is, what, what this piece of the pine cone is, um, things like that. And then also it helps you with, hey, I wanna do this next year and I don't wanna forget this. And this is exactly how we did it. And classes are different. Okay, this class did really well with this one. This class might need it to be like a little bit easier. Uh, next one is provides family caregivers with a visual. In this case, curriculum could possibly continue at home. Um, so, you know, like I said, we did nature soup. Of, oh, okay, so here's a good example. We had ladybugs. When you go to Lowe's or any um, gardening store, you can buy a container of live ladybugs and you can put them in your garden, right? The whole benefit is that they eat the aphids in your garden, which they actually don't. <laughs> they fly off. <laughs> but what you do is you put them in the refrigerator. This is on the instructions because it slows them down. You take them out and the children can pick them up and they're, they're still kind of coming out of being cold. So they're not flying all over the place and the children are able to put them in their hands. So I took pictures, I documented that and I put it on our window outside of our classroom. Well, then a couple of days later, a parent had told me, Sean, you know, so-and-so, I forget which child it was, so-and-so loved the ladybugs. And I saw the pictures and it, you know, first of all, it's so hard when the parents pick their children up. How was your day at school? What did you do? I played, you know, so with that documentation, they're able to see what happened. Well, this parent had done, gone the extra step and they went and they got a book about ladybugs. And then Sean came to school and he told us all these things about ladybugs. So it's a nice connection from the classroom to home. It also fosters language development in children. So, um, you know, they're, they're, reflecting on what happened. Oh, look, that was me. I observed that. Yeah, I predicted that. And then, you know, another form of documenting is graphing. So for instance, today, you know, we did don't let the pigeon drive the bus, not necessarily a STEM um, activity, but we graphed their answers. And with the graphing, they could reflect on, I said yes. And this is how many friends said yes. And, you know, they're, they're verbalizing what had happened. Um, allow children to reflect and provide a sense of ownership of, of their findings. Oh, Miss Caitlin, I added the um, baking soda to the vinegar and then it exploded. And I did that. That was their sense of ownership. They figured that out. And of course, as facilitators, we're not saying, well, yeah, that's what was supposed to happen. No, it was, you did find that out. You added those two together. And then you found out that they, it bubbled, didn't it? You know, or the example with the awesome, the bubble and the um, dry ice. Oh yeah, you, when you put your hand out, you predicted that it was going to land on your hand and not pop. Things like that. Uh, so language in the classroom, that goes to kind of what I was just saying. 
you know, we're using words to encourage discovery, words like explore, predict, test, think, wonder, notice, discover. Um, we're using our five senses. Sean, what did you see? Oh, what did you hear when that happened? What did that feel like? What did it smell like? Did you taste that? Did you like the way that that tasted? Um, using open-ended questions. So questions that cannot be answered with a simple yes or no. Uh, what do you think will happen if, let me see here. I'm trying to figure out what my picture is because it's covered by our faces. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is, these are my two friends in my class right now. And they were trying to build a teeter-totter and okay, which I never thought that they would be able to make something like that because of their age. It's not um, typical. They're trying to enter. It's not typical that uh, this age would be able to, I, I didn't think, you know, build something so great. So let's see, view and admit. Great. Let's go back to it. Uh, so what they did was they said, Miss Kaylin, I want to build a teeter totter. Okay, well, how do you think that you could do that? Um, okay, well, you know, we want to put it here and, and we want to put it here. And uh, all right, well, if you put it there, what do you think will happen? And of course, you notice their little fingers. What do you think will happen to your fingers too if you guys are moving that up and down? Because we have to make sure that they're being safe. Uh, and so just like using those open-ended questions, I'm not telling them, oh, hey, if you just put the wood on the log and then you sit here and you sit here, then you're gonna make a teeter-totter and it's gonna work. No, they had to figure that out on their own. And when they did that, they actually came up with better ideas than even I could think of. Like I said, it was surprising to me that they were even able to figure out that that, that log could turn into a teeter-totter. Um, and it also, we're using encouragement to keep the process going. Uh, so instead of it, oh, great job, you did it, and then walk away. Wow, you're going up and down. You figured that out, that you could do such and such, and that now you guys are going back and forth. And that goes to the observational statements that we can make. You know, instead of the good job, good job, the praise, I feel like there's kind of this, um, this call right now to eliminate the amount of praise that we're giving children. Praise is always great. I'm not saying that praise is not good. Uh, but instead of using praise, allowing them to be proud of what they've done. So, oh, you noticed that or you did that. You put that together and you made it go up and down or you built that building. You put that bridge there and that car went all the way across. How does that make you feel? What do you think about that? And a lot of times they'll say, I feel good. <laughs> I like it. I did that, Miss Kaylin. I'm going to tell my mom when I go home. You know, you could see the excitement, but they're reflecting on their own abilities versus someone else telling them that they've done a good job. You know, we're trying to get away from this whole trophy situation. Here, you did it. Here's your trophy. No, does that make you feel good though? Do you feel that you tried hard enough and you created something? So here now, I would like, if we could, go into breakout rooms. Um, I just would like if you guys could discuss what would STEM look like in your classroom if you had uh, a classroom. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then Megan, I'm gonna make you um, host. Okay, so we're gonna go into uh, breakout rooms. And like I said, I'd love for you guys to discuss what STEM would look like in your classroom. So remember that STEM teaching can be based on a teacher's perception. Um, I'm curious to see, would your STEM be throughout the classroom or would it be center-based? Would you lean towards more one subject or would you keep it all encompassing? So we're just gonna do a five minute breakout room since we only have 30 minutes left of our workshop. 
Um, and then we'll kind of come back and we'll continue with the remaining uh, slides that we have. I am just taking a minute to find where the breakout rooms went. It's okay, sure. strange. It's I not know, listed. I couldn't find mine either. It's not listed here. So let me play around. I'll mute my screen. Okay, and then if not, then we can always just discuss it live too. I always like that. I'm not used to it being hidden. <laughs> Hey buddy, got it. Okay, so if anyone would like to share kind of what your dream of having STEM in your classroom would be, that would be great. Please, now is your time to share. Nobody? <laughs> Or maybe, oh, there we go, Jennifer. Okay, um, Megan, if you don't mind unmuting Jennifer. I could unmute myself. Oh, there we go, great. <laughs> um, I was actually waiting for um, anyone else um, if they wanted to share first. Um, I actually have been learning about forest schools and um, I've watched a documentary about a forest school, I think in, uh, the countryside of Switzerland and how it really um, is their 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 whole program is in a forest and they're out there um, in all types of weathers and and uh, they uh, I really like the fact that um, that nature is your classroom um, and nature is a great teacher so um, I also have a friend who um, said that her classroom has like a sliding uh, glass door so they can open up one side of the classroom and they're next to, um, I think it's a grassy area and they have chickens, and which is great so that the chickens can come in and out as they please. Uh, so I really, um, if, I, if I could dream, um, I would really like, uh, I like having a hybrid um, just because I myself am inexperienced in, you know, a nature, <laughs> being like a nature uh, certified person teacher. Um, but I would love, uh, I love the fact that your school has, uh, is, you know, has a forest and has a stream. And um, that's something that uh, I know that I didn't grow, grow up with, and it's very rare. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I really love having those um, those nature elements, the real nature. <laughs> yeah, and that's so even though it's not a Pinterest type of STEM activity within that environment, they're able to create these engineering models or using math when they're collecting pine cones and leaves and things like that. So I love it. Anytime I can get people to say that they want to add more nature to their classroom, I'm like go because there's so many benefits to it. The children just enjoy it so much too, because they're not uh, exposed to it. I too, I grew up in, you know, in San Fernando Valley. We is very suburban. We had no nature. It was, they, we had lawns, right? Uh, so no, that's great. I love it. Okay. Um, let's see, Rosa, I'd love to hear you share. Uh, well, I have had a little bit experience on having some STEM in classrooms because I visited Montessori Rijo and my, my campus has a lab school where the kids have like the previous other person shared, they have chickens, they have animals. So the kids are learning how to incorporate natural materials in the classroom. And there's not that much plastic stuff. Everything is more nature-based. But I know that I love the fact that they get to go out. Like one of the projects I love that they did is when it was raining, the kids got to make little boats mm. and see which boat got to the end of the road faster in the rain and they got to like collect water and see like which one filled up quicker based on the container and it was so much fun for them to get to do that that's so cool 
I love it. Our stream at our school currently has a lot of stones in it. It's like concreted with stones that the children decorated, but I've heard of people doing this with testing how far the boats can go or the ships. And I would love to do that. I feel like our stones really kind of mess that up. It's so great to have those opportunities though, right? Because um, as you said, they are able to use these items that they made and place them in and, and to see like that concrete. Okay. Cause you can build a boat and say, well, I think it's going to float and I'll wait till I get home and I'll go put it in the bathtub or when you're at school and you can put it in the stream and you can see it move down. And there are other ways that these things can be made too. You know, you don't necessarily have to have a stream at your school. You can have uh, you can create a water table or something along those lines that provides them with that opportunity. So I love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, so I'll go back to um, sharing my screen and we'll go through our last slides. I'm so appreciative for you guys of you guys being here um, and, and seeing what I've provided for you. Hopefully I can do this right. <laughs> okay, so we made it through that. So, okay, so how do I find ideas? As a teacher, we're always building on ideas, you know, where, how do I do this? And I'm, I'm bored of this activity. Let's try a new one or emergent curriculum. Wow, they really like this type of STEM. We need to find something along those lines. Um, oh, I see Rosa said, less paper, more experiences. I made a sensory box for my vision impaired students. Oh, sensory boxes are amazing. And that's an important uh, part to put in too that um, children who have special needs can absolutely benefit from STEM in the classroom as well. And from sensory, I mean, oh my gosh, being vision impaired doesn't eliminate, it actually heightens, right? Your, your sense of touch and smell. And, and so that's, yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, okay, so how, where do I find my ideas? Children's museums, like we talked about. I love children's museums. Kids space in Pasadena, um, you know, you guys were talking about, uh, I believe it was the Science Center. We have in Santa Barbara, the Natural History Museum. They have so many cool deals that um, you could find. So I'm looking at my, my slide on my piece of paper here. Um, my daughter, Haley, this was at Kids Space in Pasadena. They had taken wood rounds from you know, just tree trunks. And then they gave the children clay. Oh, an Orange County Discovery Cube, love it. And they gave, so they said, cause it was butterfly season, right? So here, make a caterpillar out of clay is what they said. And then here's some seeds to decorate it with. They said, that's a brilliant idea. I would never think to use wood rounds for a STEM activity talking about the life cycle of butterflies. You know, and then here they are, they're observing the caterpillar and the shape of the caterpillar because my daughter said, well, how do I make a caterpillar? Here, let's look at the picture of it. And they're shaping it. And, you know, my four-year-old, she was trying to do it too. And that's where the creativity comes from because my four-year-old doesn't really necessarily have a frame of reference. And so she's making it topsy-turvy and, and then adding the seeds to it. So, you know, it just... Children's museums have great ideas. And even if you go alone, you don't have to have a kid with you, right? Or borrow someone's <laughs> family member's child. I love going to these places just on my own too. And I take lots of pictures. And I, I wrote here, don't be afraid to ask employees questions because there were so many things at Kids Space. I said, where did you get this from? And they were so happy to say, Amazon or Etsy. We looked this up on Etsy and that's where it is. Because I think a lot of people will ask where they find certain things. Um, and then what ends up happening is the employees have, in my experience, taken us to do extra things, right? So they took us to a plant that had caterpillars on it that made a specific type of butterfly. And uh, we, I just learned just as an adult, as an educator, I learned a lot going there. School tours. I love doing school tours. I, they, a lot of them have been shut down because of COVID, but recently I went to a lab school, a Reggio lab school in Santa Monica. And it was incredible. It was a brand new school. So the toys were fantastic, immaculate. 
I mean, the, uh, you can tell there was a big budget for this school, but still they had PVC pipe that I could, like I said, go to Home Depot and I could recreate that. Taking lots of pictures there. Um, to find that, I just typed in Reggio Schools Los Angeles and a list came up and I was kind of researching because I like to look at the pictures of what they're doing. And, and one came up, school tour on Saturday, $5 or whatever, I think it was $20. $20. Oh, sign me up. I would love to do that. And it was self-guided. So I just walked through and got to see and, and observe. And you get so many ideas from that. Rosa said, sadly, some of these schools are very pricey. And that's so true. When, uh, yes, the PowerPoint will be available uh, via email too. Um, so unfortunately, you're so right. At COC, the lab school I started at College of the Canyons, and when I started there, um, that one does have low income funding. The school I'm in now, it, we don't offer low income funding, although we do have some parents that really struggle to make the payment. And it's, it's not, it's not something that, you know, I, I feel for these parents and I wish that we could offer more for them. And it's so true that you get these forest schools or things like that, but you're having to pay for it. So that's our job as educators to continue keeping ourselves in the know and hoping that, you know, these, these government funded like Head Start and in the lab schools, like I said, this Reggio school, that was a lab school. So there was funding there um, that we're able to penetrate with these ideas and not necessarily just like this um, academic based programs, kind of like the old school way of thinking. Uh, so, okay, other ideas, social, let's see, online or in-person workshops like we have now, there's so many, that's like, there, I told my husband, there are some things with COVID that I don't ever, you know, want to leave. I want the virus to go away. I'm tired of, you know, the, the horrible stories, but please don't take away the virtual workshops because <laughs> we can do it from our home. And there's so many options out there. You guys are taking advantage today. That's really great. Uh, social media. I go on Facebook and I follow preschools on Facebook, you know, and I follow specific groups. So there will be Facebook groups that are STEM preschool teachers and they'll post their ideas or, you know, specific preschools will post their to the parents, right? Like, oh, we did this activity today. I know my preschool has a Facebook page that has uh, certain things that we've done that we want to share with the, with the community. So I've really found uh, that to be beneficial with finding ideas. The library, I actually got this book I was telling you guys about. I got this one from the library. Um, I don't ever want to give it back. I'm going to buy it. Um, I just typed in STEM and this came up. I had it, you know, sent to the library just for pickup. I didn't even have to go in. I just picked it up. Literature, Amazon has really great, great prices on uh, books and literature for STEM. There's a lot of STEM books out there. Uh, the hard part is, you, I don't know, I'm, I'm very much, I want to look at the book to make sure I want to buy it first. <laughs> um, but for the most part, you can see reviews and things like that. Learning from peers, talking to other teachers, talking to friends. We have a teacher at our school. Oh, OfferUp is good too. Um, that's, yeah, really good. We have a teacher at the school right now. Um, her job specifically is to teach nature and STEM activities with the children. So she'll pull out, you know, five children out of the classroom and, and she'll sit with them. And, and so I was talking to her today, tell me, what are your favorite STEM activities that you've done? So I can share them in this workshop <laughs> and actually I'll share it now. So she said that they took a piece of, of um, you know, a paper plate and then they made walls on the paper plate. So they had little pieces of paper that were taped down. The children could tape them down on their, excuse me, on their own and add a marble and they made their own marble run. So they were able to experiment with when I turn the paper, the plate this way, my ball goes this way, but then it stops and it needs to go that way. So I have to turn it this way. And she said that one was a hit with the pre-K kids. Three, she said that was too tricky for, her, but pre-K loved it. Google searches. I love doing Google searches, um, but look for the homemade websites. Typically when I do a Google search, you know, STEM activity, I'm going three, four pages down because you're so inundated in the beginning with buy my curriculum, you know, print this, print that. I like those websites 
that look very old school. They're very simple, but it's a teacher that has listed, oh, this really worked because those are the teachers that have the experience and, um, you know, in, in building upon those activities and not necessarily just to get viewers. Um, and then also, so um, when I'm looking for specific toys, I go on Amazon or Etsy and I search STEM toys and lots of ideas will come up. And some things, like I said, I decided that, oh, I can make that and copy it um, for a smaller price versus what Etsy is charging. And then school closing sales, as horrible as it is when a school is closing, oftentimes they'll say, come in, pay what you can, and I'll give you, you know, come take the, this inventory off of our hands, basically. So one teacher posted on Facebook this one day that she was closing her in-home daycare and she had a ton of science things. She said, you know, get it off my hands. I don't even want it. It's for free. So I came and I got beakers and I got graduated cylinders and we use that stuff in our sensory table all the time and it didn't cost anything. So there's stuff out there um, that you can search. And then of course, you know, being safe too when um, you're picking those things up. I always have to, you know, say that stuff too. Let me see here. I'm trying to admit someone. Here we go. Okay. So now we'll kind of go into, because I think we only have, yeah, we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, insects. These are the things that I have done in my school. Uh, most of the parents, I talked to the parents about them being in the workshop, um, their children being in the pictures and they were okay with it. But I know since this is being recorded, it's going to be on YouTube. So I have little pictures over some of their faces. <laughs> but here you can see to the left, my friend here is looking at the caterpillars that we had. We did the life cycle of caterpillars. Um, we used, so within that activity, it was a, more of a classroom activity because we had you know, caterpillars at one table. We had a life cycle at another table with a microscope and I had, um, I had magnifying glasses out. I had clipboards. They were doing art. Like I said, we'll talk about art too, being implemented in STEM. They were making butterflies. So it was like kind of all, you know, the engineering. For engineering part, you could even have them build a caterpillar too. I did have those little pool noodles and I cut those into pieces and I had string so they could string the pool noodles to make a caterpillar. Um, so then here you'll see in this bottom picture, that's actually a beehive, piece of a beehive that um, one of our teachers found while she was on a walk. Um, and we brought that into the school for the children to look at. They were so interested that emergent curriculum, we went further with it. We talked about bees, how they make honey. We tasted honey. Cooking is a big part of STEM too, because that's absolutely a part of science. You get chemical reactions, everything along those lines. Um, and then here's the worms too. Here is, uh, here are pictures of us um, with the ladybugs. So the children were able to pick the ladybugs up. The ladybugs have a life cycle too. If you have not seen what a pupa of a ladybug looks like, it's really fascinating. It looks like this little scraggly thing that has stripes on it. You would never think that it's a ladybug, um, but the children were holding it. This picture to the right, this little girl, she was terrified of the ladybugs, did not want to touch them. And she kind of stood back and she observed. She said, you know, you don't have to touch them. That's okay. But uh, when you're ready, if you'd like to. Well, it took her a day. We brought him out the next day. And finally she went up and she picked one up and she said, I think it wants to live up here. And she put it in the plants. And we talked about, you know, we had books and things like that about where the ladybugs live and where they're happiest and where they find their food too. Gardening is a big part of STEM. Like I said, that's more of um, the life science portion of things. Um, so we've done strawberries. Uh, we actually, during Halloween, we just leave pumpkins kind of out everywhere. The children can hold them, they can pick them up. We've got heavy ones. Well, what's funny is now that it's spring, so a lot of those pumpkins ended up rotting, right? And for the most part, we kind of pick up those pieces, but we have a space that we left some of them rotting so they could see the, the process of that. But what we found is that there's a little, um, you can see the bottom left photo 
there's little pumpkin sprouts now that it's spring sprouting all over our yard. And so we talked about, well, look at this sprout here. And it was kind of like in the middle of a walkway. What should we do? Because you're seeing, don't step on it. Don't step on it. Well, what should, well, we could build a fence for it. And then they built a fence for it with um, these blocks. What I do recommend is when you're gardening, also have a space where the children can dig freely because that's what they really want to do. They want to get in there. They want to get their hands messy. They want to turn the soil. So we always have a place for them to dig freely, to inspect, to investigate, explore. And then we'll have the actual gardening space, which right now we're growing um, bell peppers. So nature-based play, this is um, what the next workshop uh, will be about on Thursday. I have somebody that wants to come in. Um, so in this picture, you'll see one of our teachers, she's showing this student, um, I believe it's sage was what it was, but they were noticing that there's a pattern in the sage or yeah, I believe it's sage that the top part, the top ball is actually smaller and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so this friend here was showing her, look, it's a pattern and they were discussing the pattern and then the pattern of the flowers. And then, you know, we just left natural elements out for them. You know, this child here on the right, you kind of put everything together into a bowl. And a lot of times, I don't think I added this picture, what they'll do is they'll start sorting it. So they're using their math skills too. They're adding in this bowl is only pine cones and this bowl is the sage and then this bowl is all the leaves or they're patterning it as they get older, you know, every other pine cone leaf, pine cone leaf, so on and so forth. So here's a picture of um, my four-year-old collecting items for them to place here on this, um, on this wooden piece, on this bark. And uh, they counted, they were curious in how many things they had and of what to, how much they could collect. So STEM comes up in different areas. I'm more natural based, but there are also, you know, also those activities too that you can do that are very directed and, and I'll get to those also with the experiment. So here's my friend, Abby, again, she's placing those logs um, apart and testing to see if they're far enough or close enough for her to jump to. So properties of water, that's another great way of experimenting. Um, they're looking at, you know, ice that's melting and they're stirring it. And we're using that language of what's happening when you add the water to the ice, what, what is happening with the ice? And here they um, froze plants in with ice and made wreaths out of it for them to use with the paintbrushes. Sensory tables are a great STEM activity. I use lots of different things. Like I said, I got those graduated cylinders, measuring cups, scoops, strainers, funnels, beakers. Um, we had the bottom left corner with the young man with the sun on his face. That's snow, which was conditioner and baking soda. And actually the chemical reaction that happens between those two things makes it cold. And that was a really neat thing. We got to talk about chemical reactions um, between those two. So structures, going back to engineering. So there's my roads down at the bottom of what we had made and how my children weren't using them. And then all of a sudden they had some interest in them when I, I went and sat with them. And then the teeter-totter, of course. So having, you know, we have the tree trunks and those tree trunks, we did not purchase them. We just got them from a tree trimmer that was down the street. And we said, can we take these off your hands? And he was more than happy. Cardboard boxes are great. You can get strings and have fabric out with clothespins. And then they're able to figure out how to build a structure, you know, making a fort. Oh, also magnet tiles are a big deal. I like to get oil pans, like drip pans that you put underneath cars. Um, and the magnet tiles will stand up on them and they can build a structure there too with using magnets. Experiments. So um, tips for experimenting, documenting and charting, like I said, 
uh, predictions, observations, conclusions, and use data analysis to count their graph responses. So here, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see the Legos that were used to be to chart. And then art. So art has a place in STEM. Um, Absolutely. So in the top picture here, you see that they were using flowers when they were painting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also cars on a ramp. And then lastly, troubleshooting. So if you find that children are not excited, <laughs> excuse me, I've been talking for two hours now. Um, <clears throat> let me get some water really good. This is the last slide, I promise. So, okay, troubleshooting. Move materials to a different location. If they're not interested in something, try moving it to a different part of the yard or a different part of the classroom. Sometimes all that, it's all that takes, that they just needed more space. Maybe you put too much out or maybe you didn't put enough out too, so you can add or remove items. But also I say less is more. Teacher involve, involvement, simply sit. Like I said, I sat on that platform and those children came over and all of a sudden they wanted to be engineers. Um, and also you can make it a circle time activity, get them started on something that maybe they're not used to doing at home all of a sudden, oh, here, let's drip the water with the pipettes and see what happens. And now it's your turn to explore with it in any way that you want. All right, and that concludes the um, PowerPoint. I'm gonna stop my share. And if anybody has any questions, please do not hesitate to ask, I'm gonna leave this open. You're free to unmute yourself. Um, and I just hope that this was beneficial for everyone and that um, if you need anything, you can email me and I will email everyone the PowerPoint as well. Okay, well, I just wanna thank everyone so much for being here. It was really a pleasure hearing from you. Um, and I hope that you can join me on Thursday. We have our nature-based play uh, workshop. So please, um, if you can join me and uh, it was nice meeting all of you. Uh, surpass uh, I have a question sure um I hope I'm not um keeping you from leaving oh no oh no, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> thank you so much for um presenting on steam it really um opens my eyes to the world around me and and being resourceful so thank you so much for all those great um uh, tips and where to go and um how to seek out um ideas and such um I was uh, actually I had a question about your preschool. Um, so I taught at a Christian preschool in Torrance um, mm -hmm. and unfortunately it closed down due to COVID. Um, uh, so um, I was wondering, um, does your preschool have, uh, how do they go about teaching um, their curriculum? Is it something that the uh, teachers and administrators, because I know you mentioned it's uh, emergent curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, how, how is the spirituality um, uh, development incorporated? Is it like something that the school um, develops together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. So um, we're not, um, we don't do a whole lot of spiritual curriculum. Mm -hmm. The children will say a prayer before mm -hmm. they um, do snack time. And then there's chapel. Uh, oh, that nice. they, yeah, because we basically rent a part of the church property. And oh, so okay. then, yeah, and then in turn, so we have chapel that's once a week, but it turns out being every other week for the kids based on the days that they come to school. Uh, but that's about it. And that part of it, the chapel part is administered by the church and not us. Got it. I see. Okay. That that's actually the, um, my preschool was owned. It was across the street from the church okay. um, who created that program. Um, and we would have the um, pastors um, come um maybe like once a month to share 
um, their teaching, but uh, it, for us, we it was basically the teachers and administrators that created um, the spiritual development part of the um, program. So uh, just uh, since it's new to me, I'm still trying to learn how um, other other Christian preschools um, run their program and right. and to find um, a Christian preschool that has such a great nature and uh, steam. Um, curriculum implemented I think that's awesome and I haven't heard of one <laughs> so it's really intriguing to me yeah it's neat I I've heard too that some uh religious schools can go down a certain route and then others mm -hmm. a little more freedom our director is amazing so she basically mm -hmm. gives us you know the opportunity we create our own curriculum wow. and then within within range right so right. if she thinks that something is unsafe or whatnot then she'll usually speak up but uh, no, we're, we're pretty lucky with, we get to choose the curriculum that we use. And, and some teachers are more um, spiritual in what they teach and then others, not so much at all. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing because um, I haven't found a program like that in the South Bay area, like Torrance, mm -hmm. Redondo Beach, Gardena area. So I thought maybe it doesn't exist. I just had to go further. Oh, hopefully <laughs> you can find one that does exist like that. And then, you know, mm -hmm. you could find, uh, because working a, with a school that you love, uh, feels it like makes all the difference. It does right. it make a big difference. Yeah. May I ask where your school is located? What it's city? in Santa Clarita. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh. it's Christ Lutheran Preschool. It's in Santa Clarita. Santa Clarita. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. I actually have a mentor teacher who um, teaches at COC. And we had a conversation, so we were both looking <laughs> for if a program exists, such oh. a program exists. So I'm happy. I'll be. I'm excited to report to her. Who is your mentor teacher at COC? Um, I I have a feeling that you would know her very well. It's uh, Professor Gina Peterson. Oh She's yeah, the oh, teach um yes, yes director. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Awesome. So I'm excited to share with her. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, please do. I, like I said, I worked at COC uh, for right. years. And so, uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great lab school. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I had um, such an amazing time with my mind being blown. And actually um, last night, Professor Nancy Duran and um, Professor Rokia Rahman also had a great uh, workshop on um, uh, teaching life science to oh, um, curriculum and life science. So it, I thought it was just like perfect. <laughs> oh, good. I, you know, I just love the way that ECE is going. I love that we, our doors are being open. It's not just about learning your letters and, and copying your words. And it's so much more than that. And this is what the kids need. Right, thank you so much. I love like the intentionality behind it, especially for um, in EC because that's where it starts. That's their, that's their foundation. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. thank you so much again, Professor Pass. Sure. Yes, and then it looks like Rosa just said Trinity and Heights schools are good too. So maybe you have a lead there. All right, well, everyone, thank you again. Um, I think we are, no one else has any questions. Okay, great. It was so nice being with you these two hours and I hope everyone has a really great evening. Uh, take care everyone. <laughs>